Ladies and gentlemen, as you uh, finish up your dinner and enjoy that red velvet cake, um, I, I did want to begin our program. And before I introduce General Whistler, I, I wanted to recognize a couple of people in the audience. Now, I know everybody here is distinguished, and you all deserve to be introduced, but there's just a couple people that I want to thank in particular for, for being here. Number one, there's four members of Admiral Miller's senior leadership team uh, here at the, uh, at the dinner. Um, the first is Captain Bob Clark, the Commandant, and his wife, Ruth Ann. <laughs> dean Andy Phillips, the Academic Dean, right over here. <laughs> Captain Roger Isom, the Chief Diversity Officer, who's sitting up here. And Command Master Chief Taylor and his wife, Lauren, right over at table seven. We're also honored to have with us Mr. Byron Marchand, who's the President and CEO of the Naval Academy Alumni Association and Foundation, right over there. And I, I do have to... Uh, I do have to introduce a personal friend of mine who happens to be from the class of 1981 and currently the Acting Assistant Secretary for Veterans Employment and Training in the Department of Labor. Um, I've always considered him honorable, but now I actually have to introduce him that way, the Honorable Junior Ortiz, right there. And if you want a good story, if you want to stick around after, um, Mr. Ortiz can tell you stories about me as a first classman when he was a plebe. But he'll, exa he'll exaggerate, so it's only half true of what, of what he says. And finally, I want to add my greeting that Admiral Miller gave at the beginning, which is to Mrs. Lawrence, um, a remarkable woman and someone who we just enjoy having at this dinner and having the chance to honor you and your, and your husband. So Mrs. Lawrence, again, thank you for being with us. Now, there are certain individuals that you come in contact with early in their career, and everybody around them knows this is going to be a successful person. And uh, I had the privilege of working with General Whistler together on the brigade staff as first classmen here, and peers and seniors and subordinates all knew that this was a superstar who would make his mark on the Marine Corps, which he certainly has. And in my book, General Whistler is a, a leader, a warrior, a strategist, and a scholar. He combines all of those into one great individual. As a leader and warrior, General Whistler has led and commanded from the platoon level all the way up to the Marine Expeditionary Force level. His most recent tour in the fleet was as a commanding general of the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Brigade and deputy commander of the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force. Uh, he provided, in my book, extraordinary leadership in Iraq multiple times that made a difference in that whole operation. As a strategist, he's been the senior military assistant to the deputy secretary of defense, the Marine Corps aide to two U.S. presidents, and the director of the Marine Corps Strategic Initiatives Group. As a scholar, he's a distinguished graduate of the Naval Academy, the Air Force Institute of Technology, and the Marine Corps Command and Staff College. He's currently the Deputy Commandant for Programs and Resources. And to put that into perspective, General Amos is the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. He comes to General Whistler on a daily basis and says, so John, how do we keep the Marine Corps healthy ready and prepare for contingencies all over the world with very little money. And I know there's one person who can figure that out, and that's General John Whistler. Now, I also want to recognize his wife, Sue, because when I think about in 33 years of service, how many times this man has deployed, I think Sue Whistler deserves our applause and appreciation as well. So please 
Join me in uh, welcoming a friend and a classmate and someone I admire deeply, General John Whistler. Thanks. It is truly a privilege to be here tonight. Um, I do have to thank some people up front. Um, as Art mentioned, I have been privileged in my career to serve some really spectacular leaders. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of them tonight. But I do have to say I was spoiled because, as Art mentioned, I served on the brigade staff when he was a brigade commander. And if you were to ask any of my classmates who were here tonight, they all expected that I would be wearing a suit at this time, and he would be standing up here as at least a three-star general, if not a four-star general. And when he departed the Marine Corps, there was a, a gasp and sigh that we had lost a very talented, creative, superb leader that we were going to need in, in our future. It, it was much to our chagrin that we lost him, but I would offer that in his present position, he has continued to shape naval officers, and we get roughly 270 of those every year now uh, to come be Marines. And he's a big part of why the Marine Corps is a success. So Art, thanks very much. <laughs> Vice Admiral Miller, thanks for having me back. You endured one speech. You brought me back. You obviously slept through the first one, but that's OK. And I'm here to enjoy that. And Colonel Kennedy, I know, is here. We served together in Iraq. Um, and for some reason, he actually invited me uh, to come speak at the Marine Corps birthday ball, which is still one of the great events I was able to attend here. So I appreciate coming back. And lastly, the class of 1981, I have to say thanks. I don't think you probably thought so highly of me back in the summer of 1977, but that's OK. I guess time does heal all wounds, and that's OK. Um, I'd also like to share in my personal recognition, I had a much easier task than, than Vice Admiral Miller. I was only given two papers to read, and they were the winners. And so, and I did, I read both of them. I read them as I was preparing my thoughts and remarks, and I think what you hear me talk about is very uh, interesting in the sense that it matches some of those much deeper thoughts that I saw in the papers. So for Midshipman Second Class Joshua Highland and Midshipman Second Class Robert Crutcher, I have to say my hat's off to you. You took on some very difficult topics. I thought you treated them very well. Um, you probably don't know this now, but being able to write is going to be both a blessing and a curse in your naval career. You will be forced to do it because you can, and there aren't many people who can who wear the uniform. It's, it's, uh, it is truly something that uh, your seniors will appreciate, as will your peers, because you will be selected over them to do the really crappy jobs <laughs> that involve writing. Uh, a lot has elapsed, I guess, since I was in the seat where you second class midshipmen are 35 years ago. Um, underneath this building was a place called Isherwood Hall, and we uh, learned navigation there. And hopefully I'll come much closer to the target of talking about something you're interested in tonight than I did in my navigation class where I think my first triangle was about that big on a piece of paper. and. Uh, Hopefully, you'll uh, take something away from this. My apologies up front to people, to, to those non-midshipmen in the group. I'm choosing to kind of talk to them uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I might actually know something that they don't. Um, and for the rest of the crowd in here, accomplished leaders, scholars, and certainly uh, men and women of integrity, uh, you have your own path that you've been on for a number of years. So hopefully, we can, uh, you'll, you'll gut through this, and if you do find something interesting, it's not because I planned it. <laughs> um, the one thing that has changed besides the building being gone, though, is when I came here uh, and when I was a midshipman, they used to invite really old, grizzled guys that had three stars, and they looked like they were about ready to expire. And I'm glad to see that now that's apparently changed, <laughs> because they brought these robust, much younger, people with, you know, a career ahead of them, unless you ask my wife, Sue, and then my career's coming quite to a close here. Um, I'd like to start tonight's kind of serious part of this with a quote from 
one of, I think, one of the greatest Marines who ever served, uh, also a Marine who was a graduate of the Naval Academy and one who served as our 13th Commandant General, John A. Lejeune. He devoted a significant part of his professional life in describing the sacred relationship between leaders and those that are led. And there are many great quotes that come from his writings and from people who served with him. But I think this one is important to the audience tonight. It says, leadership is the sum of those qualities of intellect, human understanding, and moral character that enables a person to inspire and control a group of people successfully. I think it's impossible to parse those three kind of basic parts that he talked about. And because of that, I'm going to talk specifically about moral character, but not simply because we're talking about ethics, but I think more importantly because moral character in my mind is the foundation upon which your intellect and your human understanding build to make you a successful leader. Moral character is the foundation of all that we are and all that we will become as leaders in the Naval Service. To start with, moral character is a personal thing. That journey began, and it is great that there are so many parents here, but that journey began at home, wherever home is. Your parents started you on the path to building your moral character. It then was buttressed over years by whatever your faith is and how you've practiced that faith over the years that you've been alive. And then finally, institutions, institutions like the Naval Academy and like the Stockdale Center for Ethics. Those kinds of institutions take that and drive you to a higher place. Moral character in and of itself does not lead men and women, however. Leaders do. You as second class midshipmen will lead in the broader naval service, just like you're now in the process of learning how to lead here at the Naval Academy. And it's not only the stock and trade of officers, I will tell you that right up front. Officers are a part of that leadership quotient, but the moral character that you as a leader imbue on your subordinates and demand from your seniors is absolutely critical, and it's essential in both peace and in war. Moral character is fundamental on the personal level. It's an outward expression of our moral character in the concepts that we develop. Concepts such as the honor code here at the Naval Academy. These concepts codify institutional values. They codify what is central to organizations, whether they be the ship that you happen to be the captain of, whether it's the company or platoon that you happen to lead, the concepts that are institutionalized in that organization are the fundamentals that build those teams. President Dwight Eisenhower perhaps said it best when talking about institutional values, those that we choose or avoid in implementing. He said, the history of free men is never written by chance, but by choice, their choice. And so I would offer to the class of 2013, your choice on how you build moral character will define you as a leader and will define the success not only of yourself, but of those you lead and those who lead you. The Navy and the Marine Corps have made a choice. They've codified a set of values mentioned by Vice Admiral Miller earlier, the honor, courage, and commitment. And so I'm going to take each of those and kind of talk specifically about those, and I'm going to share with you some personal examples of how moral character in each of those areas is critical to success or has been in the past. It's critical to privates through generals, to seamen through admiral. It doesn't matter the rank all the way up to commander-in-chief. And I'll, in fact, use one example tonight. Keeping our honor clean is in the very first verse of the Marines' hymn. Honor compels us to exemplify the highest standard of moral character, to behave ethically, to respect others, 
to meet each of our obligations headlong and to hold each other accountable in a manner befitting the title that each of us has earned. On October 4, 1979, Second Lieutenant John Whistler, serving in Hawaii after his kind of first deployment away from the island, we were on an island called Kahoalave, was a target island at the time that Marines used to train on. We've since given it back to the Hawaiians and Marines and sailors no longer train there. And we've been in the field for about three and a half weeks and we were flying back to Oahu, to Kaneohe Bay. And I was very proud of my platoon and our service in that three and a half weeks and I was told by my company commander that I would be the landing zone control officer. Doesn't sound like much, but when you're a second lieutenant, you'll take any damn title you can get. <laughs> and I had a checklist because everything in the Marine Corps has a checklist. And most things I ever saw in the Navy have at least five checklists because you can't figure out which one's currently the right one. But this checklist was very explicit about the things I needed to do and what I had to do and when I had to do them. And so as the first set of two CH-46 helicopters came into the landing zone, I took my checklist, ran out, inspected both helicopters to make sure that everything was in place before I put Marines on these helicopters. And one of those helicopters did not have any life preservers on it, the LPPs, the inflatable life vests that you wear whenever you're going to fly extended periods over water. And so very proudly, I went up to the crew chief and I told the crew chief that I would put no Marines on that helicopter until he had life preservers. And he looked at me with that quizzical look that only a sergeant can have when he looks at a second lieutenant. And he said, sir, get him on the damn helicopter. And I said, I'm not going to do that. So he went forward in the helicopter and caused the co-pilot to unstrap, which is not a good thing. And this captain came and addressed me face to face because it's very loud in the back of a helicopter and told me that immediately I would get those people on the helicopter. And I told him I would not. I told him that if he wanted to take it up with my company commander, perhaps they could solve that problem, but I wasn't going to. I was deathly afraid of my company commander. It had nothing to do with moral courage. <laughs> he looked at me. He screamed something to the crew chief. Crew chief went to another helicopter that was on the ground because live fire was going on, and he came back with a helmet bag full of life preservers. And I was very proud, but not as proud as I was about to be. And I waited in that zone all day, and they ferried Marines back and forth. And towards the end of that day, the last two birds came back. And Echo Tango 06, the helicopter that I had not put Marines on at the very beginning of the day, ended up being the helicopter that I got on to fly back to the cold stares of the pilot, the co-pilot, and the crew chief. And halfway back, somewhere between Lanai and Molokai, we lost the rear engine and transmission on that CH-46 helicopter. And we went into a spiral, and we impacted the ocean, and 13 Marines left that helicopter and are alive today because a knucklehead second lieutenant with a checklist made sure that we didn't put a single Marine on that helicopter. So it's taking on the task headlong. It's sticking to your guns when you're right, but in order to do that, you have to know your right and doing what's right. Courage. Courage is the mental, moral, and physical strength ingrained in everybody in this room. It's not the absence of fear. In fact, my most favorite quote for what is courage is that it's endurance for one moment more. It steadies the helm in times of stress. It strengthens us against the unknown, it's inner strength to do what's right. And I'd like to tell you a story now about Sergeant Reitzman. Sergeant Reitzman was a young corp or a uh, sergeant in 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines. He was on a patrol in Afghanistan, a combined patrol. This patrol was with Afghan National Police. And Sergeant Reitzman was leading that patrol across one of many canals in Afghanistan, in the agricultural district in and around Marja. The current was very strong. One Afghan national policeman lost his footing and was taken away by the current. And Sergeant Reitzman, with no regard to his health, no regard 
other than he knew that that was a member of his patrol, leapt into the canal, full body armor, helmet, and weapon, ammunition, everything he had, because he knew if he didn't get to that Afghan national policeman, his life would be lost. He recovered the Afghan national policeman, got him close enough where some other members of the patrol could grab him, and then Sergeant Reitzman was taken down the canal. Sergeant Reitzman died, gave his life to save the Afghan national policeman, a man whose name he didn't know, whose language he did not speak, yet he knew in his heart of hearts it was the right thing to do. And he had the endurance to last one moment more to pull that Afghan national policeman out of the water. Commitment. Commitment is the spirit of determination and dedication. It's what compels leaders to serve our country. Everyone in this room is serving our country at this time. Art Athens mentioned my wife. I would offer every spouse in this room has shouldered the burden over time. But everybody here understands a commitment to our nation. Commitment inspires an unrelenting determination to achieve a standard of excellence and sometimes to do it under fire. It's the stuff of legend when you do it under fire. And there are so many examples of commitment under fire, I actually chose a different one. Because not all commitment is well documented. I'd like to tell you a story of tremendous commitment to our nation. I had the privilege to serve President George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41 as he's affectionately referred to in the family, as his Marine Corps aide. And while I was serving him as that fly on the wall that only an aide can be, I watched as he struggled and the staff with the economic situation of our country as we were headed into the election of 1992. And it was very evident that the country was on the brink of an economic disaster that very well could have been similar to the situation that our country is in now. And he heard all the experts, and he saw all the data, and he read all the reports, and he knew that he had to raise taxes. And the advice from everyone of his political appointees was that it was political suicide, that the country would get through this, that we didn't need to do that. And yet he saw the data. He was committed to the country. He knew that he took great personal risk if he was to raise taxes. Yet he chose to do so. He did it. It turned the economy around. In his own words, he wasn't a good enough politician to get the country to believe it in 1992. And it cost him re-election. Years later, when he was asked about losing that election, he stated, I did what was right for the nation's economy. And if I'd have been reelected, I probably wouldn't enjoy the pride of a father to have had my son serve two terms as a president. It's that selfless commitment to the nation and to what is right that is what moral character is about. I've talked about some successes of moral character. I want to finish with a story of a failure, because sometimes we learn more about failures and the long-term impacts of the failure to have moral character. This is a personal story, one that nearly cost me my life and caused me certainly 13 months of very, very hard work in the years that followed this incident. In the march north to Baghdad in 2003, an army unit was passing through the city of Fallujah. To this day, I have no idea who the individual was. I do know the unit. But they chose, the leader chose, to indiscriminately fire on non-combatants in the city of Fallujah. Killed 19 Iraqis. Some women, some children, some Iraqi males who just happened to be outside. I remember the day that report came through that everybody that I was working with, and I was south in a city called An Nasiriyah, that we had probably created a huge enemy at that one moment of bad judgment, a lack of moral character to do what was right, to take the risk and not simply fire indiscriminately into a crowd. 
In 2005, I went back to Iraq. The city of Fallujah had already been sieged twice, once in April of 2004, once in November.